your life. Have it. Right. It's not in your way now, is it? Personal session just for you then, uh, uh, Josh. Um, so what we'll do this morning, um, you've got feedback on the lab which I'll talk you through. How it all fits together is just some thoughts on the course and what, what one needs to do. Um, then we're going to look at MVC planning and visual designs. There's some slides on that. I think I'm going to skip MVC planning and visual designs. There's some slides on that. I think I'm going to skip that because we'll have it, it's not that there isn't time to do it, mm. it's that there'll be so much to pack into the session that I think will be, you know, punch drunk with the different concepts and so on. So if we take a break, then uh, it's probably, apart from anything else, uh, give you a break from my voice and give my voice a break mm. uh, from speaking. Um, and then we'll have a look at, this bit is the crucial bit for the lab this week. Uh, so for any of you guys who are, Comp 2203 and are watching this now or will be watching it later, pay close attention. This is not, well, you'll need to pay attention, yeah. but you will be, Josh. No, you, you need to pay close attention because there are some crucial things here that if you do not watch this, if you do not listen, you may make some serious errors in this week's lab. It's really important. Okay, that's for them, not for you. Okay. Uh, let's look at the feedback on the lab first. So, where are we going? I'm going here. And there next. Okay, so. Um, this would work on there. I don't know if it's a bit wrong. So, uh, lab four feedback I was slightly anxious about simply because. Uh, it's the first time we, uh, last week was the first time we've connected to the core state based server. You always take, sort of take a bit of a breath in when that happens, but it did all go smoothly. Russell had worked on it hard beforehand, so it all just worked perfect. Um, I hadn't really thought about the fact that all, all the connections and stuff are in the code provided for you, so you didn't really need to worry too much about that. Uh, we'll be starting to unwrap that in this week and next week, so that's why it's sort of got really important. Um, so, the main thing is bringing in the data from the database uh, via the class definition. We'll be unpacking that this week, so we'll need to think really carefully about making sure that the data we bring in uh, comes properly into the class definition and that we can we, we will therefore be able to use and access it via that class definition. Uh, so the main issue last week was about getting used to the syntax for accessing class methods and attributes. Um, and we had one or two things in the, like looking at the class definition, uh, getting used to the syntax of if you're referring to an attribute within the class definition, it's dollar this arrow attribute, not dollar attribute, mm -hmm. getting used to that sort of thing. Uh, so a, a reminder that the lecture slides are your friend, and that's a reminder for you guys watching this. Your, the lecture slides are your friend. Make sure you listen to what we say. We're not saying this for no purpose. Uh, so think clearly about the data you're handling. Um, so this was a comment about the fact that when you get data in, if you're iterating over a result that's bringing in data for several cars, when you iterate over it, the data that comes in will be a block of data for a car. So don't call it dollar cars when it's a single car. Mm. I think we might have mentioned that in the lecture, but again, um, um, that was really important because that was coming up in the lab as well. Uh, and it affects the way we mark. Uh, in previous years, uh, error reporting was turned off by default on Linux Bodge. Clearly last week, error reporting is on by default. That meant uh, 
that we'd forgotten that the way that the the method worked brought us up the the error which you remember from last week. Um, so um, uh, we I think everyone worked work through on the thing of error reporting zero, and I don't know if it was I don't think a couple of groups we looked at the idea. Oh, that does work. We looked at the idea. Well, the obvious then thing then to turn it back on again is error reporting one. That's why I think it was might be your group that we had a particular yeah. problem. We tried it and it didn't work. We thought, okay, well, we, we solved the problem. Let's go away and think about it. You just need to read the instructions in um, the PHP manual and it tells you what it should be. It's something like capital letters for a constant um, E underscore all or something like that. But you have to read the, the PHP manual. And it will tell you all about that because it, it isn't just e underscore all. There's other things you can do with error reporting, and it will tell you all about that. Um, so as I said, I'll leave it to you to look at the required code for, to do what you want to do there. Um, but that was a cheat in a sense. It just turned the error reporting off so that we didn't see it. Yeah. What we really need is an answer for how do we actually not have the uh, the errors. Um, so in the lab we were looking at the idea that if we took the code and split the if statement into two parts and then that meant calling a large block of code, uh, either writing it twice, which is always bad news, or creating a function with it and then calling that block of code twice, which is a much nicer way. Um, but there is another answer which I think should work, and as I say here I haven't tested it, now simply say check the variable. If it's not set, set it. Then you won't get the error. Well, what we're going to set it to? Well, we'll set it to say we can create a constant all or whatever you like, um, um, uh, or, or create a, a, a all as a, a variable. Whatever you need, you want to do to, but set, set up something that's going to stand out. Um, here we go. Tuesday morning firearm practice. Uh, so all, uh, then when you do your if statement, you shouldn't have a problem with the if statement checking for the condition, whatever the condition was that we had about the colour, whether the colour matched, or if it says all, yeah. then that should work without creating an error because you haven't got an undefined variable that mm. in the if statement that you're checking, the if condition that you're checking. Uh, but as I say, I haven't checked that one out. Left as an exercise. Yeah. Well, you might find a chance to check that in a later lab or so. So that was it basically on the labs and sort of afterwards thinking to say, ah, oh, this would help us to sort a few things out. Okay. The next thing is something or other. Let's have a look. Oh, yes, I was going to say a few things about how the lectures fit together. Let's remind myself. Um, Okay, so let, let, let's look at this and see what we've got. So, um, this is really just thinking through the different things that we've got and how much, how important the various bits are. So the video series it says here is designed to provide concrete examples of things we've covered in the lectures. So the idea is the lectures cover the theory and um, one of you asked the other week about, oh, can't get my head around that, can you give me an example? Well, that's what the video series is intended to do. So we, we talk about web, uh, creating a uh, class in PHP, the video se series demonstrates it. We talk about uh, I don't know, um, a JSON feed, the video series shows how a JSON feed might work in practice. So that's why we've got it. Um, so it is important to watch the videos through and make sure that you, not just that you've watched them, but you've understood them. I've aimed to this is the second iteration of the YouTube videos, and I aim to cut them down so that the aim was to get them down to as near to five minutes as I could, but below ten anyway. Yeah. Some of the earlier ones were rather long, uh, the earlier series, the previous series. Um, so from that point of view, it's, it's, they need unpacking because they are quite dense. Uh, so it's worthwhile spending a bit of time just looking and making sure you've got your head around it. But also, any part of the course could be tested in the exam. So um, if 
after the exam, someone says, oh, we didn't cover that in the lectures. No, but I talked about it in the videos. Uh, <laughs> don't get caught out, is what I'm saying there. Uh, so you could theoretically be asked a question in the exam that relates to the videos. Um, I'm not saying whether I have or I haven't, but uh, that's largely because I can, once I've written an exam paper and submitted it, I completely forget and it becomes a blur with all the other papers I've ever written and I can't actually remember. Um, uh, what's the third thing that we need to think about? So, yes, yeah, so this is particularly for one or two of you who might be watching this on the video, okay, <laughs> or on the YouTube. Um, the internet can, is a good resource, yes, that's true, but you must be careful. So we've already seen areas which have come up when we covered them in the labs, uh, where the internet resources provide examples that are now deprecated. So you're doing stuff in the labs, not you personally, mm. as you as a group are doing stuff in the labs, uh, which are using deprecated code, which we've said in the lectures, Okay, in these videos, we've said, don't do it. So if you then go into the labs and do it and say, did you really watch the video? Um, um, so that's important. Um, so, so it will lead to problems in the labs, that's one thing. And it will lose you the marks. Uh, but especially this week, so this week, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm emphasising this for the video. <laughs> okay. So this week we will be looking at PDO, PHP data objects. It's crucially important that you understand that the um, that the PDO data objects are are the way we're going, and because PHP is a, a language that has developed over a while, uh, it is quite possible to start mixing and matching with old approaches like the My PHP MySQL code and the PHP MySQLi code and it will mangle. If you do that it will lead you into all sorts of pain and heartache. So you have been warned, pay attention to what we're going to be saying in the lectures. Okay. Um, so similarly, uh, lectures and slides will focus on today, this morning, when you're not here but watching my video, uh, it will focus, sorry about emphasising that so much, um, it will focus on error handling via the use of exceptions and again ignore that at your peril. Where it, in a lab it's going to lose, if you, I don't know if you've thought this through, but there are eight labs worth 25%, so each lab is worth a maximum of 3.125 marks. So if you really fail a lab, lab up and get two marks out of 3.15, that's a pretty poor mark actually, you've only lost 1.125 marks. It's not a complete disaster. But it will also, if you do it in the labs, I'll bet you do it in the coursework. Mm. Then it's going to be much more important. You'll start losing marks hand over a fist. You don't want to be doing that. Um, okay, if you're happy with that, we'll go on to the first uh, set of slides should be here. There we go. So now should be able to do that. Yeah. Okay, try again. Try that. That's better. Right, so first thing I want to do before the break is think a little bit about site design. So that's going to be important when we're looking at coursework as well as labs and so on. So that's the first session this morning. So I'm going to look at something called Model View Controller, and that's important because it's something you can use, for example, if you're going to use it in um, projects, and particularly if you, if you do do any web stuff for Part 3 project, uh, Part 3, whatever you call it, you know, the big mm -hmm. thing at the end. Um, um, then if you, if you throw in some, uh, if you make your approach an approach based on Model View Controller, uh, it should earn you some real good brownie points uh, when it's marked, so that's worth knowing. Uh, we will have a, a little look at the idea of site structure. There's, there's a bit of coding in here because of model view controller. I want to think a little bit about look and feel and have a think about some practicalities. That's what I want to do. Uh, so just to uh, get us going, there, there, we can think about site design in all sorts of different ways. We can think about what the pages look like, how they operate, how they relate to the underlying code, 
how the code is structured. Particularly, this slide is going to focus on these two. Uh, but having said that, the very next slide we'll be thinking about the actual um, code and how it's structured. Um, uh, so we'll start there. So we're going to start with model view controller, and it is a particular. Have you come across that one, Mike? Yeah, we did it in programming two last year. Right, so now that's in computer science? Yeah, oh, they did it as well. They did it as well, so they've done model view control. Yeah. So, uh, so I can look, flip through this fairly quickly, yeah. hopefully. Okay, um, now when you did model view controller, what sort of picture were you given of, of um, model view controller? There's different ways it can be thought of. I don't quite remember it too well now. Yeah. Right, okay. So let, let me take you into a couple of things just to give you an idea of the things you need to watch out for when you're looking at one of your control. Because different folks understand MVC in different ways. Okay? So if you go on Wikipedia, that fount of all knowledge, which is never wrong, of course, um, uh, it gives this as, as the model view controller idea. So the, the user sees the view, uses the controller, which manipulates the model, which updates the view. That's the way Wikipedia, I don't know if it still does, but that's how it did when I checked it last time. Um, personally, I really don't like that approach because the user doesn't really handle the controller directly. Mm -hmm. The user handles buttons and things and menus and what have you on the view and the view informs the control. The user does everything through the view. Mm. So having this as a, a diagram I find unhelpful. Uh, I think, I think, I haven't checked this again, but I think I had that on there to say if you want to know more about how this is presented, I think that's a link that will do it. But if you check Wikipedia and see what it says, it is a, an approach to MVC. Personally, I don't like it. Uh, oh, there was something else I was going to say. Uh, there is, it must be on a different slide somewhere. Somewhere, someone has come in and said, oh, but web design is inherently model view controller. You've got model is the PHP, view is the CSS, and controller, uh, oh, hang on, controller is the PHP, maybe the model is the uh, MySQL. No, absolutely no. <laughs> Uh, that, that is just plain wrong. That, that's not another view, that's wrong. <laughs> um, for all sorts of reasons. Personally, I prefer this one as the uh, as the way that I like to view model view control. I think we were taught this. Ah, uh, yes. okay. So, um, uh, okay, so we don't need to go into that, but, but you can have a look at that slide if you need to remind yourself and um, uh, pick up that stuff. The crucial thing here is that the, it, it relates to the, pre, the principle of separation of concerns. In the video series, I think I might have said that, uh, oh, here we are. So this is a slide, a slide that says that websites are inherently MVC because of content PHP. So no, just no. Um, so in the video series, we're not implementing MVC. That's because it's way too simple. We have a single bit of um, PHP, which is the web page, dot class dot php you've only got one file splitting that up into three just so you can say it's mvc is ridiculous you don't just don't don't want to do it uh, but as soon as a site becomes more complex then as your code base grows uh, then you want to be um, applying it as part of separation of concerns and you will see it used on good professional sites when you take that approach mm. and you should use it on serious projects so if, if you, like I say, if you get to year three and doing your main project in, as a, and there's some web stuff in it, use MVC and you should be happy, happy bunnies. Mm -hmm. Use MVC and GitHub and uh, Bootstrap mm -hmm. and they'll be over the moon. Um, so in theory, the rest of today is about designing the view. So we need to give plenty of thought to planning the site structure, the look and feel and the practicalities. So I'm going to start... Uh, I'll start with this one. I'm sorry about the size of that. Um, I don't think, I, 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 originally I had this as seven slides. But what I want to do is just take you through this because if you're going to uh, do web development with a client, um, then it is a very good um, tactic 
to get your client to think through what they actually want in some detail. Because uh, typically a client will say, oh yeah, we, uh, we thought about it and we know we, we, we really need a website. Okay, why? <laughs> this first question, uh, you know, what, what will, what, why won't the Facebook page or YouTube channel, whatever it might be, why won't that do instead? Um, so get them to articulate why they need a website. What, what are they looking for it? But I, I then, uh, like when I did the, um, the, the project over the summer, uh, I presented this. It's not, you could actually leave it more or less like that, which isn't too professional, but they, um, they were happy with that. It was a, it was a, a maid's job. Um, so, the, the, so the first thing I do is get the client to clarify the objectives. What is the site all about? Why have you even got a site? Uh, now, a lot of this is really important in terms of saying, get your thinking really concise. So, uh, it's a bit like sort of, um, uh, what do you call them, uh, mission statements and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. The idea is to say it in a sentence. Um, if you can't say it in a sentence, you haven't got your aims clear. Yeah. Uh, that's the idea. So, um, describe what your site aims to do in a sentence or two. Uh, this is likely to form the main text on your home page. Think of how Google will display your page as a search result. So at that point, I'm liable to drop straight out and say, so this is another thing I did um, uh, over the summer. Where are we? That one. Um, let's let's maximise that again. Again, it's going to be small, but you get the idea of what's going on here. Uh, so I've just taken uh, a particular result that I know will give me the, the thing that I'm looking for. When your site, your website comes up, when you search for it on Google, by the way, do, I don't know if you know about this, when you, when you want to do a test to see what, what comes up when you search on something in Google, you probably want to pull up a, um, what do they call it, an anonymous um, uh, page. Yeah because if you don't, it will remember all your preferences and it will give you an entirely different ranking from the ranking that it gives everyone else. Yeah. You know how that. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So, um, uh, when you first get uh, listed, uh, you'll be coming up with a just, just that top one liner. Yeah. Uh, but once you've risen to number one slot, if you've done your work right, um, it might, uh, might give you two or three of those as, as uh, at the top of the ranking, and then it's out, well, I'm not going to give you six. So it gives you one with the six blocks on. You can actually, if you look at the Google Web Developer pages, it will tell you what it's looking for, and it's pulling these out, and you can set these up specifically, and that's really good. But when you're planning your website, it's really good to think through all of these and think, well, these are important parts that relate to how I design my website. So I've got site title here. I happen to have chosen, uh, just because I work part-time, you know, voluntarily for Christians Against Poverty, so mm -hmm. I just took one that I know would work. Um, so th that's a site title. So that's going to be the title, the big thing across the top of your website. You're going to have a tagline on there, like Aging Surfers, if you're following the videos. Um, you've got a, a, a tagline. That will be your tagline. Uh, you need your URL. That is not unimportant. It's important to have consistency with the title and the tagline and the, well, particularly the title and the, the URL. Uh, so there should always be a link between the two. So uh, I've talked, again, actually I did talk a bit about that in the videos, didn't I, on the aging surfers. Um, so getting that right is important. And you might have to search a bit to find out what's not taken mm -hmm. and what's going to stand out as being different. Um, so I'm giving you a bit of the uh, search engine optimization lecture, which I won't do later in the series. I'll do it in this thing. Um, so this bit, in a sentence, what is your site all about? That's relating back to what we were looking at in the previous page, which we'll go to in a minute. Um, and then here, Identify, and it says here, up to six web pages or sections that you want to draw attention to. So here are your six sections, uh, which should be structured around to give a good feel for, um, that's actually about the cat, really, and contact us is obvious, and about, okay, right, I want help, uh, and how can, so, so that looks like a, a good set of things that, that 
folk might want to know. And you want to think about what's this little catchphrase that goes in here. It's hardly even a whole sentence. Um, but just plan those through, which again we did on the project over the summer, to make sure you know that on each page you've got the the uh, the impact statement, if you like, that's going to just that's the one that you want to catch the eye. Uh, oh, well, I can't do that one there. Let's go back then to um, uh, where are we? To is it that one? Oh, I'm going to have to go back through there. Sorry about that. through. Um, okay, so we're here. So clarify the objectives, define your audience, that's important, and again that's in the videos. Um, who is the site intended for? If you don't know who you're expecting to your site, don't expect anyone else to know who is coming to your site. Um, describe the type of visitor you intend to cater for. That doesn't mean to say you shouldn't be inclusive, but you should have a clear uh, idea in your mind of who is coming to your website and why are they coming there because if you don't know that you can't structure your site in a way that will deliver what they're looking for. Um, describe the content, so what you intend to provide at those sites, specify as clearly as you can what you will and also what you won't include. So what am I putting in here? What am I not going to provide as well? Name the site, that's a bit like the search engine optimization stuff that we're looking at. So mainly for your benefit, it helps to crystallize exactly what you're providing. Probably will be the name, oh, I said for your site folder, um, for your site title, I'm gonna call that. That goes back to a long way to early days of web design, I don't know <coughs> that's still in there. Um, and it will be the do domain name if possible. Um, Capture the business processes. Did you do UML last year? No. You haven't done UML? No. Ah. Oh, that's interesting. Have you done anything along the lines of... Um, what is it? UML is Universal Modeling Language. It's no. about... Um, well, really, the, the crucial bit here is being able to look at an organisation, say, what are you doing? What are various processes and it's it's a, a formal method for doing some of this stuff about um, you know who's coming to your site and what they intend to do what are the actual transactions that happen when someone come on your website so UML is, is brilliant for doing that um, so that surprised me I thought you'd have done that maybe you'll be doing that this year in have you got some software engineering somewhere it's, it's very much at the heart um, of something maybe next semester we don't have anybody this year Right. Well, watch out for that because that's really important. And again, it's the sort of thing that if you apply that in year three on projects, that will go down really yeah, well. I think we did do it. In, let me just check. Okay. Yeah, I think we did do it. Oh, okay. In right. software modeling and design. Yes. yes. We did okay. Right. We did so things like uh, use case scenarios. Oh, yeah, yeah we, did, we did do it. And actors and. So act as the people who yeah. are in the use case scenario. Okay, right. Well. Yeah, we've done all of it. Oh, I've, I've, um, yes. No, no, that's fine. That's good. Uh, okay, so that's really good. Um, um, so, so the idea is that you're you're uh, trapping all the, the, the business processes yeah. that go on, defining it, and then once you've got those defined then that helps you to design the website to work in the most appropriate way you can start to work through those use case scenarios and say okay someone's come to this site they're trying to do this have i made it so if, if i imagine i am that person trying to do that can i does it work okay uh, and so on um, so and you can derive the necessary web content website content uh, that way uh, you need to structure the content. Now here I've said break the site content into three or four sections, five at most, because it's good HCI practice. You want to, to aim to uh, collect the resources in your website or the, the, um, um, the, 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 the sort of workflow stuff. You want to collect it into to three or four sections uh, for the same reason that we have a four-digit pin code on 
credit cards and things. Do you know about that? No. You know why it's four digits? No. Okay. It's because, uh, not because it's secure, it's laughably insecure to have four digits on a, uh, there's a PIN number on a credit card. Uh, but it's because in the early days, the crucial thing was usability. And they did some tests and four, three, two, they might have tried one out, but I doubt it. Um, uh, three, four, four, it was okay, but as soon as they went to five digits, they had a significant number of people who kept forgetting their PIN number. Mm -hmm. And it was so much hassle, they dropped it back to four, because then most folk can remember four, uh, four digits in a, in a PIN number. That's the only reason there's four digits in, in a, a, a credit card PIN number. Um, the, um, so, so when you're doing a, a menu, if you go beyond four, or well, five is sort of all right for the majority of folk, but you're already starting to lose significant numbers of people. Six, you will find it starts dropping off quite quickly. So you start reading through the menu, blah, 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 What's the first one again? And you've probably been to sites that have these great long menus, mm. and you look through and think, I've no idea where I'm going. Hang on, let's look through that. It could be that one, oh, maybe that one. And, and then, oh, which one was I looking at? And it just takes forever to find just what you're looking for on a menu, for goodness sake. So make it easy for them and keep it to three or four sections, five at the most, and then sub menus, chunk it is the idea. So um, in the early days of Microsoft, when menus started to get Complicated. Uh, they, you had menus that were chunked, so um, you did have sort of a string of options on the menu, but now they were broken up into blocks. So you had um, three or four blocks, and in mm. fact, you can still see that design today on Microsoft um, products, for example, where they go into sort of like tabs, which will be three or four tabs, and then within the tab, you've got uh, menus, and they're chunked and and so on and so forth. Um, Itemise the content. Oh, this is probably more stuff that you're doing with Mike Wall, isn't it? Um, he's, he's doing, uh, what's his module? Uh, uh, interaction design. Yeah, yeah, so he's probably doing that. So I, I'd probably leave that, to, should have left that to him. Uh, sorry if you, well, it never harms if it comes up in another module because yeah. you think, oh, well, that must be important. <laughs> um. <coughs> okay. Uh, once you've got that far, then you can itemise the content, and uh, as it says, if it, unless the site's very big, at this stage you might be defining individual web pages. Uh, it is a good time to start storyboarding into storyboarding, the idea of taking your content, maybe putting it on post-its or whatever, or either a large sheet of paper or a wall or a whiteboard or whatever, just chuck it around until it makes sense and uh, you can start to uh, get your design away. Uh, okay, so that's so. If you've done um, uh, UML um, on the other module, that's fine. But there's a, f a couple of links there that um, you can follow if you want. So I think Wikipedia is all right on UML. Um, um, yeah, so that's that one. Look and feel. So this is the bit I want to do on look and feel now. So I quite like. It's a very old book now, but design really. Doesn't, the principles of design don't change, the, the way we apply it changes and we have fashions and feds, but the actual principles of design tend not to change. Uh, so some four examples I've got here, so these are taken from that book by uh, whatever it was, Williams, Williams and Tolle. Um, so here's one, and you can see that there's a sort of difference between the pages, but there's something about them that ties them together. It's not exactly fixed exactly where it comes, but there's the one highlighted uh, letter in red which just ties it together. The underline above the head bit uh, ties it together. Um, it's a very simple design, but it works and it looks professional. And a lot of the professionalism is the lined up margins and, and these little tricks that, that just work. You don't think about it, but it just works. And you need to sort of uh, uh, look and see why is this, what is it that's making this feel right? When mine looks the same, but it doesn't work quite as well. What, what's the difference? It's that sort of thing you need to look for. This is another example. 
where again the page is a different layout from page to page, but it's tied together by the background, this sort of quill type logo that ties it together across. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's all sort of making it feel um, uh, feel good, and, and as it says again, the nice clean alignments and so on. Um, um, yeah, okay. And there's some comments in there you can look at as well if you want to somewhere. This is yet another one, the Santa Fe, and uh, again, each page is different, but they obviously belong together again. Um, so um, uh, they, those are quite nice and you've got the, the way the menu is put up in each one. Mm. Uh, and again, another very, very simple design, but again, you can tell instantly that it belongs together. And again, somehow it just looks professional. It might look out of date, but it looks professional. Um, okay, so I, I mean, none of these show the modern trend for uh, you know, the big picture or the video or whatever mm. and, and going, that way, but that that's a fashion that will pass again. Um, yeah, we'll go on for a minute. All right. I might just mention here, uh, in terms of design, my daughter did a graphic design degree, and I learnt a lot from her um, when we were advertising degree courses. Um, one of the things we were, we were doing this was the early days of desktop publishing, so you publish your own uh, advertising, uh, and the obvious thing to do is to take a sheet of A4, print it both sides, and then fold it into three. That's what you do, and you put it on the rack. And my daughter just said, no, Dad, don't do that. Take your A4, print it both sides for sure, but fold it, so, so it's, it's vertical, what's that, a portrait, mm -hmm. fold it vertically, so it's long and thin. Why? Because you'll have a row of folded in threes sitting on there, and your long and thin ones standing up above the others, and the folk will notice it. So little things like that. So we had an advertising, a, a, a fad in advertising years ago now. Might even, it might even be so long ago that it was before you were born. Time flies yeah. when you're having fun. Um, but um, uh, we had a fad for, um, well, first of all, one company came along and produced adverts in grayscale. Mm. And it just stood out against everything else. And it was really effective. Mm. So effective I can't even remember who it was. Never mind. Um, um, but then others thought, hey, this is a really good idea. Everyone copies it, and now it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. If everyone has their, their, their flyers for their courses, A, A4 vertically folded, mine no longer stands out, so I have to think of something else. Um, so it's that issue of um, uh, breaking, almost breaking the rules, but knowing when to and how to, to make it stand out and be different. And the moment everyone copies you, that's the time you've got to think again. Mm. Um, okay, so uh, some practicalities with design. So there's heuristics, rules of thumb for good design. So there's Nielsen norm. Oh, this is probably Mike Wall stuff, so I won't spend too long on this. Mm. Um, so uh, he's, he's got uh, 10 usability heuristics for the home page, guidelines for home, top 10 guidelines for home page usability. So um, it uh, might really well give you that one. It might not give you that one, so it might be a clever little look. Um, we have actually mentioned this, I think might have mentioned it in the videos, but it is important to remember that all browsers are not equal. I think that's a Williams and Tollett quote. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, I'm sure we've done this, uh, might even have done it in the lectures earlier on, about even when you think you've got a page that is designed so it will come up the same in all the different browsers, and you're on the same size screen, now switch from browser to browser, and you'll find the browsers will render them maybe slightly differently, maybe significantly differently. So remember, you're not designing for paper, you're designing rule, you're creating rules when you design the site, so that it should display in as many formats as possible. And you know about this box of design, and we'll do more on that later, there's a video on that later. Mm. Um, but uh, there is a link there if you want to look at so in terms of design, uh, this is sort of ending this one before we take a break for the, the next set of um, slides. Um, so I titled that one, Want to be Depressed, okay? And it's because um, uh, there's a website, lingscars.com, 
it is it has come third in the world's list of the world's worst websites it breaks all the rules uh, Ling at the time was uh, was told that her site had come third in the um, um, list of the world's worst websites and she was furious she said what only third I want to be the worst in the world and she has a point actually because Ling is a millionaire and uh, I'll, sh I'll show it to you the, the, um, the, let's just have a little look at this um, I'm going to have to come, come back to that um, is that the one? yeah that's the one uh, this is the website okay look at that it breaks every single rule you can possibly think of uh, it, it doesn't actually scale properly if you do that it's not responsive it's uh, th there's way too much in terms of distracting graphics mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's a single well there's more than a single page there's all the stuff on the left you can see mm -hmm. a menu that is more than four or five items mm -hmm. um, it just goes on and on and on there's no white space the colors are just in your face absolutely look at that mm -hmm. absolutely terrible um, let's go back to our slides when I can find my mouse again there we are um, I'm going to have to do um, that. Okay, so let's flip through to where we are. Um, right. So yes. Yeah, so so it it is one of the most visited websites um, in the UK. It's, it's the most visited. Uh, car hire site it does more business than any other car leasing um, mm. operation in the UK it is a huge success um, and it breaks all the rules but so what I've said here it's a bit like some, there's a comedian from years gone by before your time called Les Dawson you can find him on YouTube and um, he, he was just a comedian just a comedian he was a comedian who could play the piano he could play the piano really well he could play the piano so well that he realised he got a brilliant sketch that he could use a bit, where he would sit at the piano and start to play, and just play it so horribly wrongly that it would have you in hysterics. But the the issue is you can't just play badly. You just think, oh, for goodness' sake, stop! To to play badly and have people in hysterics, you have to be a brilliant pianist first of all. And you have to know when to break the rules to make people laugh. Mm -hmm. Just breaking the rules isn't good enough. You have to break the rules really well, if you know what I mean. And he was a master of that. He, he, he was, um, uh, I mean, it was just legendary. But you, you can find him on YouTube still. So knowing how to break the rules so that it works is a very rare skill. So be careful. You want, to, you want first of all, to know all the rules and know how to apply them before you even think about should I try being tricky here and break the rule so that's what that one's all about but I just love that Ling's cars and it's, uh, it, it just it, it's the thing to show at the end of any lecture about um, web design that's the um, that, that's for this bit we're now at 10 to are you happy to have a five minute break yeah uh, and then what we'll do is we'll do the the lecture for the labs uh, and that that will be so I don't know if you, anyone's watching live at the moment uh, but uh, whether you're watching live come back in five minutes if you're watching live uh, and if you're not watching live watch the next one it's really important well both of them are important but the next one is really important please make sure you've sorted this before Thursday okay guys <laughs> right yeah. we'll take a break